Good evening. Welcome to Oconee County Borders Commissioner meeting. Today is Tuesday, February the 7th, 2023. If you're joining us virtually, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom when it's time for public comment. After a moment of silence, we're going to ask Daniel Haygood to lead us in the pledge. Please stand. First item of business would be to approve the agenda. I would like to ask that we add item number 7.4. It's the resolution in for a quick claim deed and uh, reciprocal easement agreement for the post office property. I make a motion to approve the agenda with the addendum. Second. You have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Next item is for statements and remarks from citizens. This is for anything not on the agenda tonight. Anyone virtually? Thank you. Any statements or remarks from commissioners? We want to announce that we will host a town hall on Tuesday, March 21st, and that'll be at uh, Oconee County Civic Center. You can be there in person or you can watch uh, virtually. Our main focus of the meeting will be to talk about the uh, master plans for parks and rec and uh, six o'clock at the Civic Center. Next item is to approve the minutes. This is for my regular meeting on January 3rd and agenda city meeting on January 31st. Make a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Second. You have a motion second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Now we're going to move into our zoning matters. Just a quick uh, rundown on the procedure. <clears throat> the zoning petition shall be presented by the county staff with no time limit. The applicant and those signed up wish wishing to speak for the petition shall be allowed a total of 20 minutes. Lest the applicants reserve for rebuttal. Those signing up to speak against the petition shall also be allowed 20 minutes. The public comment section will be closed at that point, and the board can ask questions as they find appropriate. And then the board will make a decision as set out in the Unified Development Code. With that, we'll call our first item, which is Rezone P22-0155. This is Deferred Tax LLC. It's a B1 PUD on B2 to B1 business and B2. This is 33.65 acres located at 1291 Virgil Lankford Road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Again, this is uh, P220155 for tax LLC. This is the aerial photograph of the subject parcels, 45B and 45. Currently, the properties are zoned B2 and B1 in the regional center character area. And again, the request is to rezone the property from B1 PUD and B2 to B1 General Business District and B2 Highway Business District in order to develop three B2 zone lots and eight B1 zone lots for a total of 11 commercial lots to be available for future purchase. This is the concept plan that you have in your application packets, slightly larger version. These are the architectural images submitted with the application. And staff recommends conditional approval with the following conditions. One, two, and three are standard conditions. Number four, all dumpster enclosures shall be brick or stone and shall be architecturally compatible with the commercial buildings on site. All service and truck loading areas shall be screened from public view by a six foot wall, masonry wall with facade material to match the exterior of the principal building. In addition to the required 10 foot wide vehicle use area screening and landscape strip along Mars Hill Road, a 25 foot wide structural buffer shall be provided, including 
trees as specified in the UDC section 80804B1B and evergreen plant material as specified in UDC section 80804B3D. Number seven, an internal sidewalk network shall connect all uses within the development to sidewalks along the Coney Connector and Mars Hill Road. Pedestrian connectivity shall be provided throughout the development, including raised decorative crosswalks. Final design of the sidewalk network shall be subject to the approval of the planning director and shall be shown on the preliminary plat and site plan development plans for each phase of the development. Number eight, pedestrian facilities shall be provided connecting the development to Hollow Creek Lane. Number nine, all along the full length of the private access drive, private drives to both phases of the development, no sidewalk shall be located within the 10 foot wide landscape strip vehicle use area screening. Number 10, all stormwater management ponds shall be enclosed by black vinyl coated chain link fencing and screened on all sides by a 25 foot wide structural buffer, including trees as specified in the UDC section 80804B1B and evergreen plant material as specified in UDC section 80804B3D. Said buffer shall be in lieu of the required evergreen screening of UDC section 11603B5. 11, at the time of preliminary plat submittal, an updated traffic study shall be submitted to the planning department reflecting all applicable zoning conditions and recommendations of county staff, GDOT, and any third party re review conducted on behalf of the county. Number 12, Proposed site driveway number one along a Coney Connector shall be restricted to a right in, right out only, and a southbound dedicated right turn lane into the development shall be installed. 13, proposed site driveways number two through four along Mars Hill Road, as described in the traffic study dated 2-11-2022, shall be reduced to one full access entrance and two right in, right out entrances as follows. One roundabout shall be installed at Hollow Creek Lane, and one right in right out entrance on lot one and one right in right out entrance on lot two. The final entrance design shall be subject to the approval of the public works director and shall be shown on the preliminary plat and site development plans for each phase of the development. Number 14, the entirety of the project's frontage along Mars Hill Road shall be upgraded to county street design standards for arterial roads as outlined in UDC article 10. Road improvements shall be shown on the preliminary plat and site plan for each phase of the development. Number 15, a roundabout shall be installed at the intersection of the two interior private drives between lot one and lot eight as shown on the submitted concept plan. Number 16, interparcel access to adjacent properties shall be required in order to facilitate future access from the development to Virgil Langford Road. Said internal parcel access shall comply with UDC section 60802 and shall be shown on the preliminary site plan and site development plans for phase two. And 17, the total building square footage of the development shall not exceed 186,713 square feet. And finally, number 18, the development shall meet all standards of the Mars Hill Overlay District as outlined in UDC section 20604, unless otherwise approved by special exception variance. <clears throat> the planning commission recommended denial. Additionally, in, you have a memo from the county administrator outlining an alternative action to be one with conditions for your consideration in your packets. Thank you. Now we're here from the owner or the agent of the owner. Uh, good evening, David Ellison on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I want to thank you all for y'all's patience and understanding as y'all have gotten on my letters over the past few months. And I hope y'all can understand that I'm here today because of commitments that not that y'all didn't make, but the that this county made for the past 30 years. Uh, this Coney Connector was originally developed by Wendell Dawson based upon the understanding that uh, this property owner would be conveying this, giving this property to the county in exchange for this access. It was understood by the county in 1997. It was understood by GDOT in 1997. 2009, Melvin Davis again confirmed the existence of this agreement for full commercial access. And a letter that he sent to the property under the time said, we just need to run it by GDOT. They confirmed the existence of the agreement. Again, in 2021, GDOT has confirmed that they would honor these commitments for full commercial access. And so we asked the county to again honor this commitment 
for full commercial access. What's unique about this property is that this current zoning truly is unconstitutional. You cannot build on this property. This is a binding site plan that simply does not exist anymore. And this was before the connector, before 316. And so this property cannot be used at all. And so as a result of that, the county has the obligation to work with the property owner to obtain the highest and best use of the property. That's what we're asking the county to do here tonight is to work with the property owner to realize the value of this property. If y'all seen in the affidavits that we filed in the record, the county itself has tried to market this property for the exact same use we've been trying to do here today. And so we ask that you please honor those commitments and work with the property owner. You can see, you know, every B2 property in the area has thrived. I put it in the record, you see everything around here, this vision was realized. But now, you know, we're finding out today that uh, there's a potential request to downzone this property to B1. You know, I didn't have time to present a full objection to this today, but I'm going to object to any downzone to B1 as proposed by the county administrator for a variety of reasons. You know, one, to the extent that we're trying to downzone to B1, we would have a vested right to B1 as it existed in 1992 when this property was rezoned. A portion of this property is zoned B2. And so balancing the public interest versus the right of the property owner, the free and unrestricted use of this property, that balance is unconstitutionally violated by giving away and stripping out that B2, which my client already has. And so we would ask that you please uh, reject, respectfully reject this request from the county administrator uh, because it simply deprives my client of his distinct investment back expectations. You know, he bought this property based upon these agreements and commitments with the county, with GDOT. Bought it based upon the zoning, based upon the marketing plan that Oconee County put out there years ago. And it's not right and proper for my client to bear the burdens of public development when it should be borne as public as a whole. That's what these conditions are doing for today. And we're asking y'all to work with the property owner and approve our uh, application to rezone under as proposed in our application. You know, we're asking for full commercial access with the signalized light. You know, we have a traffic engineer today who will kind of discuss that today. But I'm not going to get into the mechanics of that, but I will get to legalities. You know, I understand there's a concern about public safety, but GDOT does not have that concern. I understand that the county may feel like they can deny this condition, but to do so, the county must first take it and offer just and full compensation. That has not happened. My client does not want just compensation from the county. He wants to build a development to get its highest and best use. Uh, and so we would ask that you please uh, approve our rezone as submitted to allow full commercial access to have the access that we would like along Marshall Road. You know, these uh, you know, requiring roundabouts that are four times more expensive than what uh, we are proposing is not rationally related to my client's actual uh, use of public infrastructure. You know, if my client's only providing about 20% of the traffic that's going through these roundabouts, why should he pay the full freight? And to impose a condition as suggested in this memo that would require my client to be responsible for acquiring public right-of-way is an impossible condition. A private property owner does not have the right to exercise the powers of the eminent domain. This is an illegal, impossible condition that we can't, simply cannot satisfy. Another issue we have in this proposed uh, memo is that it will be approved as V1, but then we'd have to come back before y'all again to get approved for a site plan and everything else. Well, that violates the zoning procedures law because there's no policies, procedures as to how that'd be decided. There are no objective standards to determine how, what y'all would consider. That would also violate due process. It would be zoning within a zoning decision, 
but no clear criteria how to govern the applicant. So that is unlawful. So we would ask that you please uh, approve our rezone as we have submitted. You know, we understand that this is a challenging situation, but you know, that's what the Constitution is for. That's here to protect property owners against the government. You know, I know that's an uncomfortable thing to hear, but this government made commitments long ago. The vision was realized now. And we would ask that you please realize this vision as originally contemplated long ago by allowing my client to reuse this property for its highest and best use, and that you please just work with us. Thank you. Mr. Amir. Good evening. My name is Abdul Amir. I'm a traffic engineer with ANR Engineering. Um, I was asked to do a traffic impact study for this project. I just wanted to brief, uh, present a brief summary. Um, I'm a traffic engineer, more than 30 years in Metro Atlanta area, and um, owner and president of ANR Engineering. Um, pleased to be working with the county as your consultant, designing the roundabout at the new admin building facility um, on Highway 15 and Summit Grove, uh, Road Drive as well. Um, I've done two types of studies of this project. One is a traffic impact study, and then a signal warrant study, that which was recently completed, uh, which documented that a signal is warranted at their proposed main entrance on uh, opening connector. I'll just talk briefly about the access points and our recommendations for what I recommended needed to be done to mitigate the impacts from this project. At the first, I'll speak about opening connector main entrance at the median break. Uh, we recommended it be signalized because of the amount of traffic from this development. And the number of lanes on opening connector, the amount of traffic, um, it meets all the criteria by Georgia DOT and, and state regulations and the county to install a signal there. We also recommended that a right turn lane and a left turn lane be installed on opening connector for traffic entering the project. And then we recommended two exiting lanes um, be installed for traffic exiting the project at that entrance on opening connector. I, now, given the spacing between this proposed signal and adjacent signals, we recommended that um, an inner connection be established between this proposed signal and adjacent signals. So the corridor signal timing can be done in a manner where the platooning effect will carry the traffic. In other words, if somebody stops on opening connector at Mars Hill Road, they don't have to necessarily stop at this new proposed signal. They can be timed so that they only stop at one location and they can go through three signals at the same time. That's what corridor timing uh, gives us as a result if they're all interconnected and synchronized. So that was one of our recommendations as well. Um, with the above recommendations, the study indicates that the overall intersection um, operates at a level of service A and B, which is really good for moving traffic on opening connector. There will be um, the way you typically time large corridors, there will be wait times for the site traffic, which is what you want, and you can move traffic on Oconee Connector. So overall, Oconee Connector will work uh, at a good level of service. Um, straight out 316 intersection at Oconee Connector is currently congested and will operate at level of service F as it does now. Uh, however, with the GDOT new interchange improvements, uh, the ramp intersections that will be created will not have conflicts with the heavy through traffic on 316, which is really what's causing the congestion there. So once they're grade separated and ramps are put in place, um, you will see a lot of relief on the congestion you see at the intersection of 316 and Oconee Connector. So th that's something that um, will happen with that project. The distance from the proposed nearest ramp to the median opening that exists is 670 feet approximately. And, and similarly, the distance from the median opening to Mars Hill Road signal is also 670 feet approximately. This gives an opportunity for a signal timing in a corridor when you have equal spacing. That's what traffic engineers love to see. I think it can be accomplished. Again, our analysis indicates that the traffic operations on this corridor will function satisfactorily if all recommended improvements are implemented with traffic from the median uh, opening not backing up to the ramp. 
Now I'll discuss a little bit access on Mars Hill Road. Total frontage on well, property frontage on Mars Hill Road is 1220 feet to over 1200 feet. And three proposed, three driveways are proposed on the site plan. The easternmost driveway will be a ride in, ride out driveway with a deceleration lane across from Old Mars Hill Road. The middle driveway across from Hollow Creek Lane is proposed to have a left turn lane and a right turn lane on Mars Hill Road and, and a stop sign for the side streets. Western driveway is proposed to be a full access with left turn and right turn lanes on Mars Hill Road as well. Under the above recommended configuration, the traffic on Mars Hill Road will not have to stop for any of the site traffic. Therefore, the through traffic from neighboring subdivisions and developments will not be impacted due to the site traffic at the site driver locations on Mars Hill Road. Staff recommendations call for a roundabout at the middle driveway. There are challenges with respect to the feasibility of, the, of a roundabout, given the grades on the driveway and the right-of-way limitation on the other side of the drive, roadway. The grades on the driveway will become steeper due to the fact that the entire roundabout will have to stay relatively flat and the diameter of the roundabout is typically 120 feet or so. The steeper grades um, will present a safety issue for trucks <coughs> exiting the site and stopping on an uphill exit into the roundabout. The level of service F on this driveway per the study uh, for an unsignalized stop sign control is not uncommon for driveways to commercial properties throughout Metro Atlanta on thoroughfares like Mars Hill Road. Since we will have adequate side distance in both directions, there will be no safety issue involved. Just the exiting drivers have to wait for a gap in traffic on both sides before they can leave. No delays will be involved for through traffic on Mars Hill Road in this case. However, a roundabout will introduce delays and congestion for traffic on Mars Hill Road. Therefore, in my opinion, <laughs> A roundabout here will be difficult to build and will have some unintended negative consequences for through traffic on Mars Hill Road. Appreciate the opportunity to present. I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Ian. How much time we have? 644 left. All right. Thank you. Is this a new podium? No, you just got taller. I like it. <clears throat> I'm Ken Bell, Bell and & Company, and we prepared the zoning documents that uh, you'll be acting on this evening. Can I get you to pull up just the site plan and keep it on the screen to talk from so that people better understand uh, what I have to say? I want to thank the planning department and the guy for the favorable report that he wrote on the project. Um, the zoning, the future land use map, all those things support this type of plan on this property. And just to refresh your memory, the corner parcel on the front of the property that goes down to the intersection of Mars Hill Road and Bell County Connector is already zone B2. All we are trying to do is extend that piece of property to go back to that green buffer where the larger building is shown. All of that parking area from there forward is already zone B2. So we're just slightly expanding the B2 portion of the existing property. And the rest of this property we've redesigned to be a B1 residential subdivision. So this is, if you look down in the right-hand corner, you see this is page two of three. Page one of three just showed the publics and the two lots and the stormwater detention and access. And the other rest of the lots were just lots because not only do we have to go through a zoning process, but we've got to go through a subdivision process to be able to start developing this property. So before we can get any kind of permits of any kind, we have to go through the zoning process, the site development plan approval process, the 
subdivision construction process of getting infrastructure and roads and grading of all the lots and whatnot, and a final plat recorded before the buildings can ever be built. So there's quite a lengthy process that begins the day the property is zoned. And so I call this page, I think, a year five plan. And pages one and two were basically a two-year plan. And then this sheet was another three-year plan to finish building out on all of the lots. So you're looking at a minimum of five-year plan, best case scenario to get the project built out. I'm going to really just talk about quite a number of facts. This is not going to be my opinion, but a matter of facts. This is actually one of the zoning documents that the planning department created uh, in 1992, showing the B2 zoning as it existed in 1992, and also the site development plan that was proposed to rezone the balance of the property to B1 MPD, which that occurred uh, in 1992-93. And so our request is, as you already know, to rezone the property from B2 and B1 MPD to, MPD to just B2 on the front, as I've already mentioned, and B1 on the rest of the project. So we're not going from raw undeveloped land. We're going from two existing business classifications to two revised business classifications. I actually had this property flown in 1991 before we started working on the rezone plans. And the only drawing that existed about Highway 316 at that time, this predates any discussion about the Oconee connector, was they showed us where the final version of the route of 316 was going to be located. So that is what this photograph illustrates. There were three versions of 316 before this time. There was a southern version, this version, and a northern version. I want to, I want to call to your attention that narrow width at the time that they proposed Highway 316. Again, this is 1991. In 1992, we submitted the rezone plan for the development of the property. This portion down here it was already zoned B2 at the time. We rezoned that R1 on this portion and B1 MPD on the rest of it. But again, and the conditions of this were we had to extend this road all the way to the joining property and we had to tie to um, Virgil Langford Road on the other end. After that was done is when Mr. Dawson started and they started talking about putting the upcoming connector in is when Mr. Dawson sent out letters to property owners requesting that they donate the right of way. And three days after that letter was written, the property owner responded saying that he would be happy to donate the right of way as Mr. Dawson had requested as long as his terms and conditions could be met. And then those uh, part of those conditions was access to the Oconee, uh, the Oconee connector when it was engineered. And uh, the other part of that later became the memorandum of agreement between Oconee County, which defined all of the other access points for the entirety of the property. There was going to be an access point for the residential development, an access point for um, for the, what, what is the B1 property and then two other access points on Mars Hill Road for the subject property. So we're not deviating, uh, other than meeting current county requirements, we're not deviating from the locations of any of those access points on this property. If I have any time left, will I, will I have time to rebut or do I have to have some time left on to do one? 15 seconds. No, you won't have any time. <laughs> Is this 20 minutes for one rezone request or for the two rezone requests? It's one case for us. So you had 20 minutes. Are you taking one action? Yes. 
I have some questions for y'all um, about the um, the alternate conditions that were delivered to us today. Well, that concludes the time for those speaking for. Now we'll go to those speaking against. Uh, Jennifer. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Walker. I live at 1201 DeAndra Drive in Watkinsville, just outside uh, the neighborhood adjacent to um, this property near the property. As you can see, I got a few slides that I have prepared in response to some of the concerns that I've heard um, regarding our uh, kind of a self. Oh, thank you. Uh, a group of us um, for Mars Hill for Responsible Development and some concerned citizens of Oconee County that we've had some discussion with. Um, so I want to bring to you some of the concerns that have been brought up to me that I want to relay to y'all. Um, so first of all, the letter that was delivered by Fortson, Bentley, and Ellison to, Dr. to Mr. John Daniel, um, we wanted to respond that we respectfully do not waive our right, any rights related to this process or the decisions coming from this application, and we do have a substantial interest in this proposal. Uh, so our concerns are the same as what's been um, identified thus far as far as this uh, signalized intersection on a Coney connector. So it's already been stated three consecutive traffic lights um, on, on this side of 316 within a quarter mile. Uh, additional light would be, we it's, um, had read 660, uh, it's been referred to 670 feet from both the new 316 off ramps and Mars Hill intersection. An email, internal email by Georgia Department of Transportation had said this was a substandard design um, for even an urban development. And then we also have identified uh, Mr. Pat Smeaton's uh, recommendation that the National Cooperative Highway Research Program recommends that direct property access should be denied. And so we feel like that is something to that we as residents of this area should be noted and identified in regards to the decision for this proposal. And then for the traffic concerns on Mars Hill has been stated already that whether three entrances or two and a roundabout, we still feel like Mars Hill at this point does not support the type of traffic that's been proposed by a Publix grocery store at the size that's been proposed for a B2 rezone. This level of traffic is not conducive with a collector road that is not meant for allowed for truck traffic. Traffic buildup would be negatively impacting residential and we should note future commercial areas. Gentlemen, we feel like this type of proposal would impact traffic, not just for the property in a negative manner, but any other interested parties that are wanting to develop on Mars Hill. Now, also regarding Georgia Department of Transportation, we do have concerns for long-term plans. The final GDOT plans for the intersection of Oconee Connector in 316 and Virgil Langford in 316, those are still largely have not been consolidated. And as Mr. Bell has already shown you, those plans change over time. And so we feel like a responsible decision on this rezone request cannot be made at this time with the reshaping of this the biggest artery in Oconee County that's still being finalized. And then short term, this has also been pro proposed by GDOT for some period of time that there's going to be a detour that put further pressure on connecting roads in the area through the construction phase beginning in 2024. If the project remains the same, that we want to reiterate that that's still in flux. So the convergence of all these moving pieces of this proposal for changing or for rezoning Georgia Department of Transportation construction um, and the issues on Mars Hill Road not being up to par for all of this um, just compounds the issue that we think is a problem for this area. We do feel like right now everything's properly zoned given the infrastructure and available geography of the property. We're again referring to the comprehensive plan that requires buffers to protect lower density residential areas within a near, near the character area would be impacted by higher density and commercial development of the character area. And the property we feel is developable and still economically viable as is. Uh, the road system is not appropriate for what's being proposed as an upgrade to B2, in our opinion. And with that, gentlemen, I will yield to the next uh, participant. Wilder Bailey. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd uh, 
this is a public hearing, so we don't need any comments or applause or anything like that during press presenters or when we're asking questions. So just remain quiet out there and we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Well, here I am following Jennifer Walker again, so that's not very smart of me. But my name is Wilder Bailey, and I'm, I live in 1231 Day Under Drive. I've been in Oconee County about 34 years now. And, and uh, while I wasn't fortunate enough to be uh, born here, uh, this is certainly my home, and I have a keen interest in, in everything that has to do with Oconee County. I love the people. I love the area. Um, sometimes, sometimes I use golf because I, don't, I can't play very well, but uh, golf is something that, that, that I love. And, and if I go out and pull a, a seven iron out of my bag and, and, and say, I'm going to hit this shot 150 yards, three feet from the pin, chances are that it may not happen. So I'm not a good candidate to be a, on a PGA Tour. It's pretty obvious and clear. Uh, this project of, of using this land for, for the intended purpose that the developer is bringing forward is about as bad as my, my seven iron uh, story. I think it'd be just as easy to 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 shoehorn a, a, a small version of of Atlanta International uh, uh, Airport, whatever it's called over there, into that same area. It just wouldn't fit. Um, in 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 reality, uh, by the way, uh, there's no need, need in me covering the a lot of the areas that from from the report that was done by Trans Systems. I mean, you guys all have have all that, don't you? So, but I want to read a couple of things uh, from, from the report. Uh, these, these folks have been around since 1966, and apparently the county thinks a lot of them, and so do I after reading some of their work. Safety, safety is, is, a, is a, just a, a huge part of our world. Uh, every day, people get hurt and killed on the highways, and, and uh, traffic, uh, pedestrians we, we we have an, an area that we have walkers we have walkers but we have people walking the road for exercise um and some of those folks are have toddlers they have young young children we don't have sidewalks i don't think you guys are going to build sidewalks for us and so that so our cut through traffic is, is is a concern and and we have some real experience with that when the when the traffic light was was put over on Mars Hill two or three years ago, we had a lot of a lot of additional cut through traffic, and some I'm I'm, I'm sure was as high as like 50 miles an hour. It was just unbelievable. And I don't and no, I don't want speed breakers. Um, so when a pedestrian gets gets hit by a car doing 20 miles an hour, they have a certain opportunity to survive and 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 that sort of thing. When they're hit with a car going 40 miles an hour, the, the opportunity to survive is almost zero, and uh, it, it's it's just, it's just a, a part of life. And I don't know who who comes up with these ideas about how much traffic is going to be added to the area. If you go out to to the to the connector out there at four or five in the afternoon and start counting cars, and I dare you to do that. I don't think you can come up with a good number of how many folks are going to be trying to turn into this property. But our area is already saturated with enough automobiles. It, it, it really can't handle much more. It, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Another real life example, the traffic light down at the quick trip. Uh, if you go down in the morning and afternoon, you can oftentimes, I'm, I'm talking about regularly, you could be sitting and have a green light and, and see a car or two come flying by running a, 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 a for sure red light. Uh, I doubt that we have enough, enough uh, budget now, you guys know this better than I do, to provide enough uh, police officers, deputies to stop this stuff. It's nonsense. Since the pandemic happened, people are, are less interested in driving safely on the highway. And I'm surprised. And, and then over on, on, on the back side of this property here, where it's suggested that there'll be an entrance way to, to, to this development, there's going to be a flyover over there and, and at some point in time. And, and I don't know, if, have you guys seen any plans, approved plans for the flyover on either, either one of these major intersections? 
Is that, a, may I ask that question? No, you're welcome to talk. We're not. Okay. We're listening to what you got to say right so, now. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's, it's, it's from looking at, at the plans, I don't think there's any possibility that, that there's enough room on the back end of this property to go out on Virgil Langford after the flyover goes through. I don't think it fits. It just absolutely cannot fit, in my opinion. Um, price analysis. The Oconee County, this is from the report. The Oconee County Connector is an important arterial roadway facility providing mobility and connectivity to Oconee County residents and commuters from, from the report. As detailed in the guidelines and research above, the addition of a full access site driveway intersection so close to S S S S 316 and Oconee Connector interchange ramp intersections would negatively affect safety and operations. Again, I know you guys ha have, have all this stuff. Uh, if you look at the, the, the conclusions, I'll, I'll try to sum this up. Uh, Smeaton, the, the vice president of the company, ended his comments on the proposed access to the shopping center for the connector with three conclusions. Based on the current GDOT guidelines, the guidelines from NCHRP, which he said what that is early publications, the crash history for a county connector and the desire to maintain long-term safe and efficient traffic operation on the county connector, Oconee County staff feel that it is in the best interest of the county and county commuters that a full access inter intersection not be provided on the Oconee connector. Well, great, that's wonderful, but the, and, and I agree with that, but all of a sudden, all that traffic goes up to Mars Hill Road, potentially. Mars Hill Road, our subdivision, it, it, it has, has, a, has a deal where I can have a horse. It's zoned, uh, I don't know what the zone is, but I can have a cow or a horse in, in, my, in my area. Mars Hill Road was, was in that same light. Uh, it's, just, it's just not built. They, they want to suggest that, that, the, that the, the area that would be impacted by the development would be upgraded to a certain uh, standard that would, that would be applicable for the situation. That doesn't deal with all the traffic and all the stuff coming down Mars Hill Road unless they do a, a reroute of the traffic, and, and that's not going to happen. So this whole matter is, is just not workable. It's, 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 it's unfortunate that, that, the, that the land is sitting where it is, but Oconee County and no county is charged with the responsibility of making whole or making good any investor in any property. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the, the simple end of all this. I urge you to turn to, to put this, this matter to bed and, and, and make it go away. Thank you very much. Yep, Smith. Christopher Smith, I know the nickname, so okay. for official purposes, <laughs> Christopher Smith. Um, I've lived at Canyon Creek subdivision since 1989, so I've been there for quite a while. I've seen the development going on, and a lot of things there, they've talked about things that happened 30 years ago. Well, things changed since 30 years ago, so the plans need to change along with that. So what you're promised to do, if you didn't act on it, then you wait 30 years to do something, too bad is my opinion. Um, with all the other development going in the area from the Costco and that whole movie theater area and all that stuff, the traffic coming around, what's coming around a county connector is changing dramatically. I've noticed since Costco put in a huge increase in traffic. It's really difficult sometimes when we're pulling out in the morning to pull up our subdivision to make a left-hand turn because the traffic on Mars Hill Road is atrocious. And they even have to put the light up. It's still hard to make a left-hand turn coming out. There's a hilly road. Any more traffic in that road is going to be extremely detrimental. So keep that in mind. The other thing is, is during the planning commission, every seat in here is full. The hallway is full. They asked, does anybody here want to, to talk for this project? And zero. Nobody wanted to. Multiple people here. Everybody that was here was against it. The citizens are saying, we don't want this. You guys are voting by the citizens. Do what they say, please. Mr. Jenkins. Thank you. I'm speaking in opposition uh, to this proposed regional retail zoning. 
In my opinion, good community planning calls for keeping similar functions together and providing appropriate transitions. This petition before you fails in both categories. The area around this site has actually been developed as medical office and institutional, both to the north on Oconee Connector and east on Daniels Bridge Road. Generally, you find medical and institutional offices, not regional retail. The commercial property that is developing along Mars Hill Road, north of Butler's Crossing and south of this property has largely been office and institutional. The closest regional retail is three miles away at Butler's Crossing or across the Loop Road at the Epps Bridge Center. Most especially, I point out there is no fast food restaurant nearby. Regional retail and fast food reference are out of place here. Regional retail would not be a good transition to the adjoining residential area. The property is gateway to one of the premier residential areas in Oconee County. Mars Hill Road and Rocky Branch Road contain solid, substantial neighborhoods, plus several large estate homes. The proposed regional business would be a disruption to the appeal of these neighborhoods. I draw attention especially to any proposal for fast food restaurants. Noise from outside speakers uh, would be audible for nearby residents, and Mars Hill Road is ill-equipped to handle the backup of cars idling. Renting this intensive zoning would open the entire Mars Hill corridor to similar unattractive intensive commercial development. All in all, a neighborhood village with no fast food restaurants and lower traffic volumes would be more appropriate for this property. And I ask you please to vote to deny this petition. Thank you for your consideration and thank you each for your service to the community. Zach Sheffield. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm Zach Sheffield, uh, 1151 Founders Lake Drive. Um, most of my points have already been covered, uh, especially by uh, Jennifer earlier. Um, I did want to bring up, uh, had mentioned a few of these at the Planning Commission meeting before, but um, uh, one thing is just that um, I, I guess the primary purpose of this proposed rezone does not fill a public need at all. We do not need another grocery store right there. There are already four within about five miles, or uh, I'm sorry, about a five minute drive and a Walmart and a Costco. We do not need another grocery store there. Nobody would be going to a grocery store there without passing one that already exists. Um, I would also point out uh, kind of tying in with the traffic study uh, things, we've talked about how um, the, uh, the, the traffic has changed already remarkably with the opening of the Costco. Um, I will kind of echo the sentiments that Jennifer mentioned before, um, especially as we see the GDOT projects unfolding. Any traffic study that has been done to this point is already hopelessly obsolete if it predated the Costco, and it's going to be even more so once uh, work begins on the uh, on the new interchanges and things. Um, I will uh, also, I, I didn't catch the, the gentleman's name, talking about the 30-year-old agreement uh, and all of that. I, I agree. I, I think if you uh, arrange a thing 30 years ago, if you had built it 30 years ago, the area would look very differently right now. Maybe, uh, you know, the development would have taken that into account instead of uh, moving on without you. Um, I guess basically in, in conclusion here, the uh, so I, I do agree with one of the things that the petitioner's representative uh, did, did say at the planning commission meeting, uh, which is basically that I don't see how this development works without a fully signaled uh, um, intersection on a Coney connector uh, because truck traffic would then have to come out Mars Hill Road. Even more though, I absolutely agree with the county planning staff that there is no way that this development works with a fully signaled intersection there on a Coney connector. Uh, we have too many traffic lights there, too many traffic lights there. Um, so from where I'm standing, if it can't work without a traffic light and it for sure can't work with a traffic light, the only reasonable conclusion is that it just won't work. Thank you for your time. Can't read the first name, last name Cox. Yes, ma'am, come on up.
My name is Aubrey Cox from 1020 Chris Court. Uh, my spouse and I have been residents of Wellbrook Farms in Oconee County for over four years. When we moved to Athens, we were especially grateful to get away from the terrible traffic conditions where we already had where we live. We know that as we age, driving becomes a challenge and access to various conveniences is a big plus. Make no mistake, we like easy access to grocery stores, drug stores, and even the Piedmont Regional Health Center. None of what is proposed, in, in my view, and I'm new to all this, um, seems to make that better. We already have an easily accessed Publix, a Kroger, a Costco, a Trader Joe's, a Walmart, and I think I'm, probably some others, grocery stores, all within 10 minutes of our house. It's plenty. So this intersection in question is already the most congested I've seen in Athens area. In this particular case, we strongly believe that more is not better and we really oppose development at that site. We just can't visualize how this is possibly going to improve our lives. And frankly, it's just going to be a royal pain in the butt for anybody near this development. In addition, and there's a second point that I don't think anybody's touched on that I'd like to make. As a retired wetland biologist, I can tell you what mitigation in projects like this often look like, despite what an environmental impact statement might tell you, and it ain't pretty. The proposed development does, does have a small wetland that drains directly into Barber Creek. Now, Barber Creek is a very special waterway. Some parts of it look like a beautiful National Geographic photograph, and it runs right through our neighborhood. Runoff from parking lots and miscellaneous garbage is inevitable when there are heavy rain events like the one we had last month. No, a few drift fences and a retention pond are rarely sufficient in extreme weather events, which is... <clears throat> it's called hard time zone. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm pretty hearing. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and close the public comments. This time, this will be the commissioner questioning. I'm going to start off. I got a couple. I think, David, maybe from your letter, a couple clarify. Which one, sir? Uh, the first one on November 28th. Okay. All right, so you talked about the, in the first section there where um, GDOT took an additional 12.932 acres. Was that a true taking or was that just a purchase? Well, any purchase would also be a taking. I mean, okay. But in order, in order there, there take, was money exchanged hands on that transaction. This is a constitutional requirement. So, yes. Okay. But the, the property owner does not have even, even bargaining power with the government because the government can force a you know, co coerce sale. I understand they donated to Oconee County. But then sold property to DOT was is my understanding of reading through the documents. Under threat of condemnation, yes. Okay. Um, corner lot is the partial C01045 B at 6.84 acres. This currently B2 with no site plan. That's the current B2 they were showing up on. Uh, so it's already a B2 zone piece of property. Just like the other three corners but yeah they've had no development on it from my understanding it's part of the stream issue the only way this project works is to have this type of project where you can have the density to fund basically the development to handle the stream uh, my, we have all the credits we have all the permits and unfortunately that takes a lot of money in order to do that you, know, you have to develop the entire site just that one parcel that's B2 in of itself cannot be developed due to all the environmental issues concerned with that. Okay. So I've been through the agreements where the property was donated to Oconee County and that was ratified by the Board of Commissioners. I don't find any mention of a median cut in any of those documents. Were you able to find that? Well, 
contract does not have to necessarily be memorialized in a formally written document. A contract can be memorialized through correspondences and through communications. And it's been consistent for the past 30 years that representatives of the county have had conversations that have been memorialized in writing to confirm the existence of this agreement. Right, but from the first communication to the last, there were changes in there. All I'm saying is what was voted on by this Board of Commissioners back in 97 did not mention a median cut. It's only talking about access off the connector through curb cuts. It's specifically at station 37, 56, and 53 related to this property. Perhaps it was not required because everyone understood what that meant. All these communications demonstrate that it was it didn't need to be expressed because everyone was on the same page. And it was difficult now, 30 years ago, to understand what I mean, we weren't parties to those conversations, but we do have these documents that memorialize contemporaneous conversations. You have these letters from GDOT understanding that everyone was on the same page too. Okay, but when you read when you read Mr. Sheckerford's letters, when it's mentioned in the media cut specifically related to access on the fire station. Well, that was in relation to the fact that part of the deal was the property owner would be giving an easement, a cross easement to the county as part of that. Yep. And so that was part of the part of the benefit the county got from this property owner was that you know what we're going to give you part of this easement. And oh, by the way, you're going to have access through this median break. I think that's uh, the letter that's referenced from Mr. Shackford in 1997. Yeah. But any anytime that's mentioned, that's only during when it's mentioned on the fire station side, the eastern side of the track where it was divided. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm, could you repeat that? Please? Yeah. The reference to a median cut appears to me to only be in reference to the eastern side of the track, specifically for the fire station access not necessarily because if you recall the legal description of the of the deed to the county specifically references um that median cut okay so the the prop the deed from the property owner that gave the county connected to the county you know, specifically references the median cut that this property would obtain the benefit from then in 2009 the letters you're talking about from chairman davis that time appears to be there was an attempt to change the location from whatever station to move it closer down to the existing fire station. So it appears to me those letters are referenced to moving it back to the specific point that are that's documented for access for the fire station. And if the GDOT at that time believed there was a full median cut for both sides, they would have installed that as part of the Oconee Connector project. Why didn't they? Well, I think a large part of that is when they had this deal cut out between the county and GDOT was that they negotiated away a large part of, uh, basically gave away uh, the right to access. If you see the deeds, a large strip of the property is now limited access. And instead of you know, forcing the GDOT and the county to exercise their power within that domain, said we will give up this right in exchange for the median break at this particular location. Right. I guess I would, just, I would just argue the median break was for the eastern side, and in 2009, when it was installed, it was installed with the intent of what GDOT had planned to do at that time. In addition, I, I know the project definitely would not have happened without uh, without the donation, but I think there was, there was some definite economic benefit with additional access that the, the property owners at that time achieved. Um, 2009 track C0145 BC sold for about $933,000 an acre. 2018 C01AR001 sold for over a million dollars an acre. So there were some more benefit besides the median break that were taken into consideration. Sir, it, I would just submit though that the property owner was entitled to just an adequate compensation. And part of it that was obtaining this full commercial access. And we have correspondences from people who are actually parties to these conversations with the county as part of the record. And I understand that you're sitting here 30 years later, we're not a party to those conversations, trying to extrapolate, speculate what those conversations were, but we have documents that support our position. Well, you have John, if I could remind the board of one kind of principle of, of law, contracts not spread on the minutes of the board of commissioners don't bind the board. 
in order to bind the board, a contract has to be spread on the minutes of the board. Um, the second part was on talking about access on Mars Hill Road. Yes. Um, so right now there's no left turns into this piece of property and no left turns out. On Mars Hill Road? Yes, from this property because there's nothing, mm -hmm. there's nothing there. Um, the traffic study submitted shows with no build, the traffic along Mars Hill in that area will grow about 12%. Uh, forget what year span. I think that's three or four years span. Um, with with a development, the gross traffic count will go to 17,781. So in 1992, when the donations were done and it was zoned, the whole track was going to generate 7,000 average daily trips, gross. In 2021, when they came back, uh, that was denied, there was 21,933 gross trips and now we're down to 17 781 on a smaller track so when you look at trips per day by acre you're talking less than 150 in 92 you were 468 and 21 and now it's 528 today uh, with less square footage than you so three and a half times David daily trips based on the consultant um I'm not really sure some of the stuff we're asking for on improvements could be considered a system improvement versus a project improvement uh, when it's working now. So I just wanted to. Uh, well, I guess the issue though, is that still you're asking the developer to pay the entire freight, pay a hundred percent of the cost for these roundabouts and you're potentially going to make him exercise powers of eminent domain, which you can't do. I don't think anybody was expecting that. I will get some comments on that later. I mean, it, it can be done. He will have to give us some more right on his side, I would guess. Typically, that's how it works. Um, I don't think we've ever asked anybody to go. There was no intent for us to but, encourage him to try to <laughs> him well, to donate. That, I, mean, <laughs> I understand. It, 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 I understand. You made a good point. Part, yeah. yeah. part of the zoning conditions. So that's why we're objecting to it. I agree. But the issue is that, you know, Right now, I mean, it would be entirely appropriate for, let's say, you know, if this project is contributing 20% of traffic through this roundabout, for the property owner to put up 20% of the cost of that, that is directly related to the actual increase onto the public system directly related to this project. It would not where, be- Where does the 20% come from? I'm just using an, an example. Okay. The problem here is that y'all are asking the developer to fund 100% of the cost when he is not 100% of the traffic. That's the issue. But you're 100% asking for it. I'm not asking for it. I'm not standing up for the commission, so don't tell me that, that what you're asking is 100%. And let me ask you this, because I didn't see it. Uh, let me ask you a couple questions. If, if we bring more traffic in that area, the county would be voting to do that. Not you, but we would. We accept it. Do more flows of traffic cause, do you see more accidents when you have more vehicles? Yeah. Generally speaking. Yeah, I would assume so. Okay. All right, let me ask you this. If, you're, if we're talking about the traffic that's going to be on the connect, I saw the report from the gentleman. Nothing was said about Morris Hill, that I recall, about the numbers. Is that correct? Yeah, most of the, the most of the analysis was based upon the connector because the issue, I mean, the issue with Mars Hill is not necessarily I mean, the volume that'll be created. The issue is the fact that you know what there's been a lot of complaints about congestion. You know, that seems to be the large complaint about Mars Hill is congestion. And these roundabouts do not advance the public interest because they will be increasing the congestion on Mars. Look, you're not talking about how you get in and get out. Okay. What I'm talking about is when they come from Rocky Branch or they come out of the out of that area, are you going to see more vehicles on Mars Hill Road? 
I would submit that any use of the land other than it currently is currently used is going to increase traffic on Marshall Road. And under that logic, any sort of use of this property would increase traffic and will then in turn harm the safety. The challenge that this commission has is to balance that right versus the unrestricted use of the property owner. If this is memorialized in the Constitution and state law. I appreciate you giving your lecture to the Constitution. I really do. I wasn't expecting that tonight, but I do, I, I do appreciate it. But my, my point is, you're, you're, you're proposing a project with a lot more traffic on a two-lane road, which, in my opinion, is you're putting more vehicles, as, as, as it's been stated, it's already congested. If it's congested, you got vehicles. Current. Let me finish before you get going. And so if, if you've got more vehicles coming in, and they're not going to be just coming in off the connect. It's going to be coming all in there. And it's additional vehicles. I'm assuming they're going to be coming from all over to get into that project. Would there not be more accidents? Yes. Any okay. any use of this property other than all what land is going to increase the accidents. That's all and if the county is going to take the position that any that this should be denied solely on that ground i would submit that this is a taking so you're telling me i should not worry about my granddaughter who lives over in that area and her mama going to school what i'm saying is, is that are, the are you telling me not to worry about Absol my citizens Absolutely they're not, not your citizens they're mine i live here too well then i worry about you traveling through there but i certainly worry about my daughter and her two kids, she lives over in that area. And so they are citizens and I don't want them to get hurt. Me neither, but is it the county's position that nothing should be on that property? I didn't say that. Well, what point I'm is the balance? Dealing, I'm dealing with what you are proposing. That's what I have to vote on, not something else that I haven't seen. The problem is right now, this property cannot be used at all because it's bound to a site plan that doesn't exist anymore. Nothing can happen on this property because of the zoning. That is the unconstitutional zoning this property that exists here today. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody? A question will be for Daniel on the the memo related to the providing right away. Do we need to make any changes to that, or is that typically understood? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can clarify my memo. I'll clarify. Yeah. Okay. The uh, no, I, I actually agree with um, Mr. Ellison on this one. On, under fourteen, the revision of staff condition uh, as an addendum: all road improvements, including design, right of way acquisition, and construction, shall be responsibility of the owner shall be completed prior to issuance of the first building permit. Uh, I would strike as an amendment to that the right of way acquisition. Um, that's covered under existing item three, which requires donation of right of way for the owner. Should should this be approved? Consider that the officially amended memo recommendation. Anybody else? Let me just add about project improvements and system improvements. When a project improvement is located, when an improvement is located immediately adjacent to a pro to to a project, even if it benefits the overall traffic flow, it can still be a project improvement because you wouldn't need that but for the project that was being built. Otherwise, everything would always be a system improvement, right? Because it would benefit the rest of it. So. If you've got a new project coming in, it's adding to a condition, it's changing a condition, which clearly almost any project does, and you require an improvement at the project to deal with those things, that's a project improvement legally. System improvement would be if half a mile down the road, you said, we need a roundabout down here because of what this project is doing. Now, it can be a little more nuanced than that, of course, but generally speaking, Project improvements are the things that are necessitated by the project located adjacent to the project on the project. Thank you. All right, we'll entertain a motion at this time. I'll make a motion to deny rezone P22-0155, the deferred tax LLC B1 PUD general business district plan unit development and B2-0155 
highway business district, the B1 general business district, and B2 highway business district, plus or minus 33.657 acres of 1291 virtual land for growth. Second. We have a motion and a second to deny rezone request P22-0155. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Does anybody wish to make any action on the memo from staff? Nope. Ladies and gentlemen, we still have some additional business. If you would step outside, away from the doors, please. Yeah, there's no nothing to it. We were asking about the 14. Yep. Wow. All right, next time is appointment of the Hard Labor Creek Reservoir Management Board alternate. As you know, we did have um, Tim Durham. He was our uh, water resources director as our alternate. He's no longer with us. So... As would be a custom, we uh, would recommend appointing Adam Layfield as he is the interim director of that facility to be our alternate on Hard Labor Creek Management Board. I'll make that motion. Second. second. All right, we have a motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Melissa, second quarter update. Sorry, nobody wanted to stay. <laughs> they wanted to go. Oh, we got some people. There we go. In the back. All right, thank y'all. <laughs> They're watching from the comfort of their homes. Um, good evening, thank you. Um, I am here to present the financial update um, for the a quarter's right, the second quarter of FY23. Uh, so this is through December 31st. Um, I would like to um, give you an update on, got it. Um, some of the major funds, revenues, and expenditures um, of the county, so including the general fund, um, capital project information, uh, sales tax revenues, and um, water resources revenues and expenditures. Uh, so we'll start first with the general fund, um, second quarter revenues. Um, we're presenting here the amended budget as of 12-31 at $37.9 million, with revenues collected at $26.4 million dollars. Uh, so 69.73 percent collected, um, which uh, is what I would anticipate to see for second quarter. So to look at that in a little bit more detail, uh, we have the categories of our major revenue streams presented for you. Um, so if you look at uh, top to bottom taxes, 69 percent collected. So that includes real property taxes and insurance premium taxes. Uh, one thing to note about those two items is that they're collected annually, so their uh, collections aren't spread out over a monthly basis throughout the year. Um, so at mid-year point, you would expect to see approximately 50% collected. This does exceed that, and so it's for that reason that it does. Um, also the case for uh, intergovernmental funds at 102% collected, uh, those are grant funds that the county receives, so it includes LMIG funds from uh, the state of Georgia, uh, one-time collections for those each year as well. Um, all the uh, Most of the other categories contain monthly revenue collections, um, which those are where we would anticipate seeing those. Um, other financing percent collected at 98%, uh, that contains sale of assets. So if we have uh, vehicle disposals that were authorized earlier in the fiscal year um, and anticipating another round of vehicle disposals in the current fiscal year as well. And investment income collections are a direct result of the change in market interest rates that were unanticipated at the time we built the budget. Okay. 
So moving on to expenditures from the general fund, you see a budgeted of 41.9 million. Um, again, that budget is amended and does include any amendments authorized directly by the board and also multi-year project uh, approvals as well. Uh, that budget is different than the revenue figure um, by $3.9 million, which represents that we're using prior year revenues to cover some of these multi-year projects. Uh, so that's something um, that we would use from assigned fund balance from previous years as an example. And those expenditures totaling 16.6 .6 as of December 31st are 39.79% spent. And we look at those based on the department that they've been spent from. So most of the departments are hovering around that 50% mark. Um, Ones that are less, for instance, the uh, district attorney's budget um, is one that is less, is because there is an annual payout included in that budget that is paid out closer towards the end of the fiscal year and not on the front end of the fiscal year. You'll also see that here with the joint governmental programs, large annual payouts loaded into the front of the year um, for allocations to joint government. You also see some items that are less than that 50% mark, and those are typically the departments that have some of those larger projects in them that are still pending completion and moving forward. So to look at a couple of those items and kind of give you an explanation, um, starting with public works at 28% spent, uh, this budget does include paving, which would typically happen in the spring. So as we move into the third and fourth quarters, we would anticipate those um, percentage spent to be closer to the budgeted numbers. Operations includes the purchasing of fleet vehicles and some costs of the administrative services building that have not been spent at this time. Public safety includes support of E911 services, and that's an annual allocation done towards the end of the fiscal year. As community development also supports the special facilities buildings, and that also was done closer to the end of the year. Community development also includes some of our larger debt service payments. Um, of those um, principal and interest payments, the principal portions aren't due until after the second quarter as well. So all of that to say, while we still look under 50% at half of the year, I believe that these budgets are good numbers and that we are leading towards staying within those budgeted figures and don't foresee any, any issues. Just an update on some of our capital projects that are completed or in process. Um, we are catching up on some FY22 items that have been ordered and weren't received until later, um, while we still do see some longer lead times. Um, hydraulic trailer has been received from prior year's budget. Uh, Parks and Recreation has received their budgeted equipment. Uh, jail fire panel has been completed. And the Frank Norris building re uh, renovation is also completed, as well as the Herman C. Michael multi-use courts. And still in process are IT hardware upgrades the Administrative Services Building, Highway 15, a 441 roundabout, um, and there is a design and process for Hawk Mountain Pass. Uh, vehicles specifically are also under those capital expenditures. Um, this information is current as of today. So while the vehicle spending were uh, not in the uh, expenditures, as of today, we have received all of the vehicles that were budgeted for uh, from last year and in this year uh, within the last two weeks. Um, so that is a positive note. Our local option sales tax distributions. Um, this is the fourth quarter collections in comparison with prior year. So we see an increase of 15.25% and 56% currently collected towards budget. And we have the same information for special purpose uh, local option sales tax. An increase of 14.56% over prior year with 89% collected towards budget. Um, and just as a reminder, this uh, SWAST fund is budgeted based on what we anticipate spending. So this is just an indication that we have collected 89% of what we plan to spend in this current fiscal year. 
Okay, and these FOSS projects um, include these items listed here. These are from the 2015 SPOS referendum and the 2021 referendum, which are the only two SPOS we have remaining that have funding available. Completed project for this fiscal year includes law enforcement vehicles purchased from SPOS. And currently in process, we have the courthouse, um, final phase of the HVAC system replacement, a fiber line running from the courthouse to the administrative building, a water and sewer infrastructure, um, SPOS is contributing towards the Calls Creek plant upgrade. Uh, we have file, fire rescue vehicle that's been on order for quite some time that's expected to come in in the spring of 2023, uh, along with uh, fire equipment that's remaining. Uh, this current year's budget and the Oconee Veterans Park HVAC system replacement uh, in process as well. And looking at our water resources department um, as our enterprise fund, uh, revenues at 16.3 million and collections of revenues at 48.48% of that budget. Um, they are right where I would expect to see them. Their expenditures um, are at an amended budget amount of 39.8 million which does contain um, budget amendments for large capital purchases um, for calls Creek plan upgrade. Uh, so their expenses spent today at 6.6 .6 million are only 16.67% expended. So I do wanna show you kind of the operational budget compared to their expenses so that you don't have all the capital projects included in those numbers. So looking at it from this perspective, they are following their budget um, spending what's budgeted for, and they appear to be on target for the year as well. And these are the capital projects that are currently being funded. Uh, Calls Creek plant upgrade is in process, so that's phase two. Phase three is the transmission line, which is in planning phases. Meadow Spring sewer extension is in process, as well as the Daniels Bridge force main in process. Um, we do have um, Daniels Bridge lift station expansion and Dowdy Road sewer extension that are in the initial planning phases. Um, their vehicles are in process of being procured and they did receive a mower replacement that was related to uh, an equipment repair that was needed. So the funding source for all of these capital projects come from various locations, including their capacity fees, loss, renewal and extension funds, um, some of that which is from fund balance and as well as the GFA loan that was recently approved. So that is an overall update on the second quarter of the county. Um, everything is strong in my opinion, and I don't at this time have any um, unfortunate news to give you, <laughs> uh, but I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Yes, sir. Just for the record, uh, Mr. Chair, remind me the, the start date for the peace block. Uh, so collections will start April 1st. This year. So we'll get our first check in May. Get our first check in May. May. Okay. And just just for my education, how do our businesses notify the fact that do we go knock on doors or is this revenue department? I mean, we're Farmer Revenue issues a notice, but uh, Melissa also sent out notices and some of those started arriving today actually. Okay. So to all the businesses that have license, they received a letter from, from Melissa, plus Department of Revenue will also okay. post it on their website and change the documents. So so starting uh, April 1? Yes. Okay. So actually, they'll change it on their system. So even if you don't collect it, you'll have to pay it. Uh, so <laughs> it's a good incentive to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, next time is considering and approve a memorandum of agreement with the uh, Georgia Department of Transportation for additional preliminary engineering of roundabouts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. This is a memorandum of agreement with GDOT regarding additional um, uh, funds for, for oversight of the roundabouts. This was previously handled as, a, as just a staff letter. Um, they're insisting on a roundabout um, MOA right now. The actual budgeted amount is, is included within the mid-year adjustment, which is on consent agenda. Um, but this is um, 
so we can proceed with the Snow's Mill and Race Church roundabout projects um, so GDOT can continue their oversight. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions on this? Just for information, what's the timeline now? Is it moving around or is there still, are you willing to have a ribbon cut date set? Well, not on a federal project. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep. He's trying to keep me calm. This has been one of the well, worst experiences as calm. chairman I've been involved. Yeah, that's just about all complete. So where they are right now is they are finalizing the right of way documents. Um, that should be done within the month. One is tracking ahead of the other. And that to determine what needs to be taken, if any. That's, that's correct. And so we're we're ping-ponging back and forth within the monolith that is GDOT, uh, which, which is requiring an MOA to proceed with okay. it. So, uh, yes, it's still tracking according to the initial timetable, but it is laborious. I object it to the original timetable, but they're bound and determined to stay on the original time. <laughs> so. yeah. All right, so we have a motion for that. Yeah, I'll make a motion. We approve the uh, memorandum agreement with GDOT for additional perimeter engineering. Does it have to be a not to exceed 68 grand? No. Okay, just approve it. Second. Here we have a motion second to approve. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carries. Next time is approve the alcohol license request for Golden Pantry. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Golden Pantry number 34 has made application for a new alcohol license for retail package sales of beer and wine. The registered agent, Mr. Garrett Crumpton, has completed his RAS training. Golden Pantry number 34 is the one at Butler's Crossing at 1010 Mars Hill Road, Watkinsville. Um, the application is complete, so we request approval of this new license. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Have a motion second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you, motion carries. Next time is uh, the post office document standard. Yes, um, I asked for an approval of a resolution that I've prepared. Um, I'll review it very briefly. Um, county and the authority have cooperatively provided the Watkinsville Post Office uh, pursuant to the lease between the authority and the post office. County and authority believe it's proper and in the public benefit for the post office property to be owned by a tax paying business. The authorities entered into a suitable sales agreement accomplishing that result with ex an experienced owner of postal facilities. Therefore, to, do, to facilitate the conveyance, the board approves the declaration of reciprocal easements, which is necessary because we have four properties that share utilities, uh, electricity, telephone, water, sewer, uh, and drainage. So we've got all that accommodated in the declaration of reciprocal easements. Uh, and also approving a quick claim D for the chair to chair the clerk to sign delivering the post post office property to the authority so that they can convey it pursuant to their contract. Just a motion to approve. Any questions? I make a motion. With, no, I got a question. <laughs> yeah. I got one. Okay. Does this include the inner parcel access? Um, no. It includes inner parcel access at the location. Uh, yeah. Everybody uses that driveway. And the reason it doesn't is because it would require the U.S. Post Office to approve it. And that apparently was the last for a while. Okay. So we tried. Make a motion to approve the resolution as submitted and, and for the uh, chairman to sign the quick claim fee. Second. A motion second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Does any commissioner wish any item to come off the consent agenda? Entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the consent items as presented. Second. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. We do not have data executive session. So, Commissioner Sachs. Motion adjourned. Second. We are adjourned. Yeah.